Uh, our next presentation, uh, hopefully to confuse us a bit further, uh, is a, a, a Shia Ismaili uh, Muslim Christology uh, by Khalil Andani. And I'm particularly happy to introduce Khalil to you because he really is the person who conceived this event in the first place. So as we hear him speak, we can be grateful not just for his presentation, but for his idea uh, to put this together. Um, Khalil Andani is a chartered accountant and graduated with a Bachelor of Math and Master of Accounting degrees from the University of Waterloo. So I guess our first non-alum. Uh, his, his areas of interest include comparative theology, philosophy, metaphysics, hermeneutics, and perennial philosophy, on which he writes and conducts seminars, uh, in which he writes and conducts seminars. Through his literary and intellectual activities, Khalil seeks to revitalize the Shia Muslim intellectual tradition of esoteric thought and explore common ground between Islam and other faiths. Khalil will be, producing a, will be pursuing a master's degree in theological studies at Harvard this fall, where he may encounter some of our alums. So, thank you, Khalil. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, it's my honor to uh, be with all of you uh, this afternoon and to uh, present to you uh, Shia Ismaili Muslim Christology. And uh, Shia Ismaili Islam is an esoteric interpretation of Islam, which seeks to uncover the deeper hidden meaning behind what we see in the scriptures. Uh, as a result of that, it, it's a very, very important encounter in the Muslim Christian dialogue. Uh, the Shia Ismaili voice. And in this sense, the uh, great scholar Henry Corbin wrote that the conditions of the dialogue between Christianity and Islam change completely as soon as the interlocutor represents not legalistic Islam, but this spiritual Islam, whether it be that of Sufism or of Shiite Gnosis. So to begin, um, I'm going to just uh, contextualize Shia Ismaili Islam in the broader framework of Islam. So uh, Muslims today are comprised of two major branches, the Sunni and the Shia. Uh, the Shia Muslims, in addition to affirming the oneness of God, that Muhammad is the messenger of God, Shia Muslims hold that the Prophet Muhammad actually appointed and designated his cousin and son-in-law, the Imam Ali, as the successor of his knowledge and authority and that thereafter the Prophet's knowledge and authority continues in an institution of leadership known as the Imamate, and that the Imam Ali, the cousin of the Prophet, was the first Imam, and that thereafter this Imamate has been handed down through specific descendants of the first Imam, the Imam Ali. And the Shia today are comprised of two major branches. One is known as the Twelvers, because they believe in a total of twelve Imams or spiritual leaders. The other is known as the Ismailis. And uh, the Ismaili Muslims trace the line of Imams to a present living Imam. And uh, the present and 49th hereditary Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslims is His Highness the Aga Khan. So Ismaili philosophy was articulated in the 9th and 10th centuries, which is about the same time that Sunni theology was articulated. And Ismaili philosophy is based on the esoteric interpretation of the scriptures and the teachings of not just the Quran and the Prophet, but the teachings of the hereditary Imams that the Shia believe that the Prophet himself has appointed to lead uh, the Muslims. So uh, this is just a snapshot. This is what we see in the Quran what the Quran says about Jesus. So in this sense, um, my presentation really continues from what's been shown so far, but I will be getting into the more hidden meaning of some of these things as per Ismaili philosophy. Uh, what I've bolded here are things that I'll be able to touch on uh, more directly. So to begin, um, for all Muslims, Jesus is recognized as a prophet and messenger of God. But for Shia Muslims, a prophet and messenger of God has a very special status. For the Shia, the Prophet Muhammad, as well as the Imams of his descent, of his descendants, they are the bearers of a spiritual or mystical light. And this is something that we find uh, alluded to in the Quran itself. So this light that is carried by the prophets 
and the Imams is a light that God created before the creation of the cosmos. And we find this in the teachings of the early Imams of the Shia Muslims. So in other, in, in Sunni Islam and in Sufi Islam, this pre-existent light is called the light of Muhammad or the Muhammadan reality. And thus in Shia Islam, the prophets and the Imams actually have two natures. They have a created human nature, but they also have another heavenly or celestial nature. And that is identified with the light of Muhammad. So Christology takes place in this context. So we need to look at this in a bit more detail. Um, as, as it has been already mentioned, in Islam, God is the absolute, infinite, transcendent reality. And this is also true for Shia Ismaili Islam. Um, in Ismaili philosophy, God is so exalted that he transcends all attributes. Even attributes such as life, knowledge, power, God is seen as above and beyond anything that we can conceptualize. Right? God transcends description. And according to uh, Shi Ismaili philosophy, the first being that God created was the light of Muhammad, which is otherwise called the universal intellect. And this once again goes back to the earliest uh, Shi'i Muslim teachings. This universal intellect, theologically, is the same as God's creative word, what the Quran calls the kalima, and what uh, some Christians and others call the Logos. And this word, however, is not God, but it is the first originated being. And everything in the cosmos has been created by God through the universal intellect, as this diagram depicts here. And thus, in Ismaili philosophy, all the names that we would usually characterize God, so the knowing, the living, the eternal, the perfect, the one, all of these names actually apply to the universal intellect as the first originated being because God in his true essence transcends all attributes but the attributes are still real they simply belong to the first originated being and this intellect one could say is the it's like the face of God and the intellect is men manifest on earth through prophets and so this then brings us to the Ismaili Muslim notion of prophecy and the imamate uh, the Ismaili belief in the prophets is expressed by this verse of the Quran. Now, of course, the verse seems to be talking about the creation of heaven and earth in six days. But according to its esoteric meaning, the hidden meaning, these six days refer to six historical periods of revelation, each of which was, be was inaugurated by a prophet or messenger of God who was also succeeded by a line of imams. And this is just a little rundown of the six major prophets from the prophet Adam to the prophet Muhammad. Each prophet was succeeded by a line of hereditary leaders or imams. So Muhammad here is the last of the prophets. He is succeeded by imams from his descendants and they culminate in the appearance of a seventh figure known as the Mahdi or the Qayyim who is not a prophet but he is a divine guide, a guide, a leader who unveils the inner meaning of all religions. So the prophets bring to earth a book and a divine law. The imams that follow the prophets, and I've written some of the names here, their job is to interpret the scriptures. Jesus' role in this framework is very important because Jesus' role was to confirm the law, as the Quran and the Gospels tell us. And Jesus confirms the law by revealing its inner hidden meaning. And this is something that we see throughout the Gospels. And this is why the Quran refers to Jesus as the Spirit of God, because Jesus' role was to bring the spirit of the scripture and reveal that to his followers. So in this conception then, the prophet and the imam is the locus of manifestation of that universal intellect, which is that pre-existent light. What is a locus of manifestation? A locus of manifestation is a reflective mirror. So what this means is that the pure human soul of the prophet, of the imam, and in this case of Jesus, which is in complete submission to God, that pure soul is a mirror for the divine names and attributes of the universal intellect. And this is depicted by this diagram that you see here. 
So by virtue of the Holy Spirit, the divine attributes of the universal intellect shine in the soul of the prophet or the imam or in this case of Jesus himself. But notice there's no incarnation going on. The universal intellect remains in heaven. The soul of Jesus, the soul of the prophet is a pure servant of God. But here, here's the, the catch. It's because Jesus is the servant of God. It's because of that that he is also the reflection of the divine names and attributes. So that's something to ponder over. And for this reason, you see the Quran describes both the prophet Muhammad and Jesus with names and attributes which are rooted in God's own names and attributes. So from here then we move to the matter of the crucifixion. And this is what the Quran actually says about the crucifixion. We have to look at the verse in context. The Quran is referring to Jesus' enemies and it says that they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, son of Mary, messenger of God. And then the Quran goes on to say in reply to this boasting, but they killed him not nor crucified him, but it was so made to appear to them. So according to the outward meaning, I would submit that the Quran is not denying the historical fact of the crucifixion. The Quran is replying to the boasting and arrogant claims of Jesus' enemies because they were mocking him by claiming to have killed him. In other words, one could say that really it's the will of God that Jesus was crucified and it was not due to the will of his enemies. Now, the esoteric meaning of this verse, according to Shi'i Ismaili philosophy, is as follows. Jesus, in his human form, his human nature, was killed and crucified as a martyr. But Jesus' pure spiritual soul was neither killed nor crucified, and that was raised to God, because you cannot crucify and kill a pure human soul. The Ismailis understand the crucifixion verse in reference to this verse, which says, Think not of those who are slain in God's way as dead, nay, they live. And in fact, one of the major Ismaili thinkers, Al-Razi, to prove this argument, goes on to quote the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the spirit, establishing a duality in Jesus and for all of us between a body and a soul. And it was, yes, indeed, the body of Jesus was crucified. But the soul of Jesus, as the locus of holiness, could never be crucified, even if anybody you know, tried really hard to do it. So then we move now to the matter of the second coming. Um, according to uh, Ismaili uh, philosophy, the second coming can be understood in one of two ways. In the first sense, the universal intellect, or light of Muhammad, which is manifest in Jesus, it was manifest in the prophet Muhammad, it is manifest in every imam including the first Imam, the Imam Ali. And in that sense, the Imam Ali is reported to have said, quote, I am the Christ who heals the blind and the lepers. I am he and he is I. Jesus, the son of Maryam, is from me and I am from him. And once again, this statement by the first Imam of the Shia Muslims must be understood in that higher mystical sense and that it's the same universal intellect that is reflected in him. And it was the same light that was reflected in Jesus and it's the same light that was reflected in Muhammad. Then the second coming can be understood according to a second sense. And this is what the Quran alludes to here, but not very explicitly. So Jesus will return to earth before the messianic age. Now what that, that return, of course, is still symbolic. Jesus' return in this sense is symbolizing the fact that a future imam, a future hereditary imam from the line of Shi'i imams will come to the world and will reveal universal wisdom and restore justice to the world. So the return is not of Christ as an individual, but it's the return of what you could call the Christic function. And that Christic function is taken on by one of the future Shi'i imams. And then, following this symbolic return, the Mahdi or the Qayyim, known as the Lord of Resurrection, he appears and he unveils the spiritual meaning of all the religions and all the scriptures and begins a seventh or messianic age for humankind. So then, um, I, the best way for me to conclude today is by sharing with you, and, and this sort of is intended to 
to be a commentary, a symbolic commentary on, on what you saw on the posters of this symposium. You see, you saw a Shahada and you saw a Christian cross. So I'm going to share with you as I end the Ismaili esoteric meaning of the cross and the Shahada. So for the Ismaili philosophers, the Christian cross from, you know, in addition to its historical significance, is a sacred symbol. And the Ismaili philosophers drew a correspondence between the cross and the four words of the Muslim Shahada, La ilaha il Allah. Because for the Ismaili Muslim philosophers, the cross and the Shahada are two symbols for the same spiritual meanings. And in order to illustrate that, they noted a structural correspondence between the two. And here's what I mean. So when we look at the four words of the Shahada, we find this is a one statement about divine oneness. It has two parts, a negation and an affirmation. It's made up of only three Arabic letters. The Shahada has four words. It has seven syllables and it has a total of 12 letters. Then the Ismaili thinkers looked at the cross and they noted that the cross is united in one center. It's made up of two lines. It's made up of three geometric forms. It's made up of four branches. It has seven faces and it has 12 sides or points, depending on whether you're talking about the Eastern Cross or the Western Cross. So this is a correspondence between the cross and the Shahada. And for the Ismaili Muslim philosophers, it means that these two are symbols of ultimately the same deep meaning. So for example, they understood that the four words of the Shahada and the four words of the cross symbolize the two highest beings in the spiritual world, which are the universal intellect and the universal soul, and the two highest personalities of the physical world, which are the prophet and the imam. So Jesus' crucifixion is a highly symbolically significant event because Jesus is being crucified on this cross. And the fact that Jesus was crucified in public is also understood as a type a foreshadowing of the future. So the Ismaili philosopher al Sijistani, and I'll end by, by, with his quote, he writes that Jesus informed his community that the Lord of resurrection, of whom he was the harbinger, will unveil the realities in the forms of the religious laws and the people will know them and not deny them. This would be like a whole population seeing someone crucified. So Jesus' public crucifixion is foretelling a future period when spiritual truths will be unveiled publicly. And in that sense, Jesus' crucifixion is a revelation of spiritual truth. In fact, that is what revealed Jesus to the world. He continues, what is crucified on the wood becomes something unveiled, although previously it was something concealed. The cross thus becomes a clear sign and evidence of all the ranks of the hierarchy Christian veneration of it is something required of them as similarly our veneration of the Shahada. So the Ismaili philosophers actually affirm that yes, Christians should revere the cross and Muslims should revere the Shahada because outwardly these symbols are different but inwardly there is a unity. So to conclude then, if there's anything that we can take away from these Shi'i Ismaili Muslim perspective, it's that while religions may have outward theological differences, these outward theological differences may be reconciled at the level of deeper esoteric meaning and thus outward diversity may in fact simply be a symbol of inward unity. Thank you very much.